Welcome to A Well Cared For Human, the podcast that tries to convince you that you are 100% normal and an even better than okay example of the human species, despite the fact that sometimes we feel like the craziest, most incapable, or worthless creatures on the face of this planet. I'm Corey, an author, a creative, and the host of the show. Whatever you're bringing to the table today, I hope this episode proves to be a dose of inspiration for you on your quest to become a well-cared-for human. You can find the episode show notes, your free wellness blueprint, and more at awellcaredforhuman.com. And as always, thank you for listening. Hello humans, it's your host Corey, and today I want to talk about what to do in a crisis particularly an emotional or a mental crisis. This topic was one that I had planned to tackle at some point. After all, we can't strive to be well-cared-for humans if we don't know how to care for ourselves during the inevitable crisis, when our emotions are triggered and we are essentially down for the count. And because I've endured many an emotional crisis, I had hoped I could offer some solid strategies for such trying times. What I had not expected was that I would be writing this episode when I was having an emotional crisis myself. But I am, right now, as I record this, it's been five days since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court, and in those five days, I've mostly been lying in a heap of despair, doom-scrolling on my phone with my emotions cycling through rage to depression to being completely shut down. And the feeling of helplessness has certainly come up every time I think of rape or incest victims being forced into motherhood. And it's probably no surprise to you that I would be so affected by the idea if you know my mother's story from Who Killed My Mother. She was an incest survivor, and my abusive father went to prison for rape. So on both fronts, I know exactly what kind of suffering awaits children born to such parents, and I would never wish that suffering on even my worst enemy. And so it's incredibly difficult to see it sanctioned by law. So no, I didn't initially consider politics as a trigger for an emotional crisis. I thought I would be talking about the sort of emotional crisis that overtakes you when someone you love dies, or gets hurt, or is murdered, as was the case with my mom. Or maybe you or someone you love gets really bad news, like the cancer is back, and there's not much time left. Really, any of those moments where it feels like the world has stopped, it feels like the train that was working just fine yesterday is suddenly off the rails. And to add insult to injury, other people are going on as if nothing has happened. The sun is shining, people are walking their dogs or posting pictures of their food. It's disorienting to be in an emotional crisis when the world goes on as if it's business as usual. Regardless of why you chose this episode, whether it be a personal or political crisis, I do hope that you find something helpful here. And despite the reasons why I'm creating this episode now, most of the advice is applicable to any emotional or mental crisis. This is the blueprint I use whenever I need to pull myself out of what I call the death spin. And now, because I am a writer, and I'm all about using my imagination, I want to ask you to imagine a spaceship Yes, a spaceship. I hope you like sci-fi as a genre because we are on a spaceship now. You are the captain of the spaceship that's cruising through space. Something blips on your radar, but before you can fully register the situation, boom. A space rock has slammed through the side of your hull, punching a hole in the metal. Oxygen and other important space stuff is being sucked out into the big black void. And you have entered the death spiral. Your spaceship is spinning off into nowhere out of control. What do you do? Well, if we're being honest with ourselves, our first reaction is probably unconsciousness. We have been knocked out by the impact, or we're just completely freaking out. And that was me this weekend, lying on the couch, in a heap, doom scrolling through the news and obsessing about all the possible horrible outcomes of this. But in addition to overwhelm or shock, sometimes we experience panic, sometimes we start screaming at our crew, aka the people around you. Or we start running from machine to machine to machine trying to figure out what to do first. Or we might cry. Or we might be the sort of person who springs into action because not acting is just as terrifying as the crisis itself. However you react initially, I still call this phase the spin. We are spinning. 
we're not okay and we can't yet figure out what we need to pull ourselves or the situation together. And at the beginning, this is a perfectly natural reaction. Panic, fear, terror, absolutely normal when something serious happens. But these emotions are not especially helpful to us in the long term. So slowly, we begin to regain control of ourselves, of the ship, and this is how we begin to move ourselves from the death spiral to stabilization. The first action step we can take is damage control. There are things that we can do to switch from panic mode to captain mode. First and foremost, try to stop doing whatever it is you're doing that's making the situation worse. In the wake of the Supreme Court's ruling, I was glued to the news. I read article after article about the decree. I could not stop scrolling on social media. I was going into the comment section. Oh my god, why would I ever go into the comment section? And I was whipping myself up into a fury in a way that only reading the comment section can do to a person. Yes, it's absolutely natural to want to understand what is going on and what will happen when disaster strikes. But drowning myself in information only does one thing, and that is zap me of my will to live. <laughs> Remember that in a crisis, it's more important what you think of what's happening than what other people think about what's going on. A mental or emotional crisis is a dangerous time to absorb the opinions and ideas of others. We tend to get confused when we listen to other people too much in the best of circumstances, and during a crisis, this tendency is so much worse. So try to eliminate the external noise and stop any behaviors that you're doing that are making those emotions stronger. Get off the internet, stop checking the news, stop talking to other people, stop obsessing, stop dwelling, stop running worst case scenarios through your mind. Try not to think things like, yes, the cancer is only in my right boob today, but it will absolutely reach my brain by tomorrow morning. That sort of catastrophizing when you're already stressed does not help you. And sometimes I can't stop myself, even though I know I should, and I will ask for help. I can hand my phone over to my wife, or I can turn on the internet blocker or unplug the router for a few hours. Anything to give my mind a break from spinning. Anything to stop the influx of information that's keeping me reactive or paralyzed. And again, it might not be a political crisis. It might be someone you love has died or your marriage has ended and you're staring at these divorce papers unsure of what to do next. Whatever it is that you're facing, just try to slow the moment down as much as you possibly can. And if you're doing something to whip those emotions up, stop doing that, because it won't help you. The next action step is to regain control of your energy, to address your emotions. We need to save the oxygen that we have and to protect our spaceship. Self-preservation is key to our ability to go on. So step two is about diverting power to where it will help us the most in protecting our precious assets. And let me be clear here, you are the precious asset. You. You can't do anything without yourself. And for that reason, your well-being matters. The quality of your mind matters. This step is about doubling down on your self-care and your wellness strategies in order to restore your equilibrium. Revisit those Toolbox episodes, episodes 1 through 8 of this podcast if you need to. For me, I will also turn on Pima Children and start binging her audiobooks. I find her voice and her thoughts very soothing. And I have about 20 of her titles in my audio library, so I'll just turn one on and I'll let that be the voice of reason in my mind for the time being. This doubling down of your self-care might require a lightening of your load. Remove all tasks or responsibilities from your to-do list if you can, so that you can focus on taking care of yourself. Clear the calendar, cancel those appointments, tell people that if they love you, they will leave you the hell alone right now. Yes, you will reach out to them soon for support, but right now, leave the chocolate on the table and shut the door on their way out. But if you can't lighten your load completely, if you can't strip your life down to the bare minimum for a while, maybe you've got kids or people who count on you, or maybe taking time off for a mental health break just isn't feasible for you financially, then focus whatever free time and energy you have on your emotions instead. The big oxygen-sucking hole in the side of your ship is going to be caused by your strong emotions. Strong emotions love a crisis. A crisis will always give your biggest fears and heartbreaks a megaphone, which means that suddenly the voice that was only a low-key plague in the back of your mind on most days 
will now seem very loud and very overwhelming and completely insurmountable. But we can address this negative dialogue like we do all other strong emotions. No matter how loud those thoughts are, no matter how much they yell at us, we begin by remembering that we are not our emotions. Emotion is an energy that rolls through you. It is not you, and you have the choice to feed that energy or to starve it. Ideally, you would want to land somewhere in the middle where you're not whipping up your emotions into a frenzy, but you're also not shoving them down and repressing them. Because if you repress them, then you'll have a lot of explosive rage to deal with later, which is no fun. Leads to horrible headaches. Zero out of ten. Do not recommend. So how do we address our emotions? How do we approach them without getting sucked into that big hole and thrown out into space? I always gravitate toward understanding. I need to understand what is happening to me. And because I'm an intellectual processor, I like to think about stuff. I will immediately start looking for a reason why I feel the way I feel. Some kind of logical explanation. In this instance of Roe vs. Wade being overturned, it was pretty easy for me to make the connections of why I was getting so upset by the ruling. Every time a new state was added to the list with a complete abortion ban, with no exceptions for rape or incest, I was forced over and over again to think about my own life. I was raised by a rapist. I was raised by an incest survivor. I know exactly what kind of suffering and turmoil these children are going to be forced to face if they're brought into this world by such parents. I'm also very aware of the fact that right now we do not have the support systems in place, which means that these children who are brought into the world in 15 or 20 years from now are going to be traumatized, they're going to be addicted, they might be alcoholics, they're going to be suffering, heartbroken people trying to navigate this world. This is, of course, assuming that they make it into their 20s, because we all know that I almost didn't. It is a hard reality to imagine. It's really hard to stomach. But by understanding why I feel the way I feel, where I'm coming from, I can begin to give myself a bit of self-compassion. I can validate and accept my own emotions, two tactics that make emotions smaller and more manageable. If you can accept and validate your emotions, they're less likely to consume you and overwhelm you. So I can validate myself by saying, yes, this blows, this is absolutely awful. There is nothing wrong with me feeling the way I feel given my background, given my lived experience. This is a very rational way to react to this situation. And that's the first step toward relaxing back into my body, back into the moment despite the presence of this crisis. And next I go deeper. Which for me, that means meditation. If I can, I'll get down on my meditation cushion and I'll start looking at these feelings more closely. I have shrunk them down a bit by validating them, but I want to get them even smaller, and so a closer look is needed. For some of us, the reality is when we're in a crisis, sitting down is not an option. So this could also be done as a walking meditation, or while pacing and squeezing the hell out of a stress ball <laughs> and muttering furiously under our breaths, whatever it takes. I just need to get to a place where I can start looking at my thoughts. And the first technique I'll try is called labeling. I just want to identify what I'm telling myself in my head. What am I thinking? What am I saying to myself? What am I afraid will happen? Despite the circumstances, this is a really good chance to become very intimate with the deeper parts of my mind that usually hide themselves from me. Things that have a tendency to hide in the back of the mind for a long time tend to surface in a crisis. Crises shake us up. They bring things out that normally we would overlook, that we would ignore. I've really gotten to know myself over the years when confronted with different crises at different times. But what does looking closer mean in practice. I'll sit on my cushion. I'll spend some time looking at my feelings, just seeing whatever comes up, and I'll label each thought in either one of two ways. I could keep it simple. Every time a thought comes up, I could just say thinking, which essentially means that is a thought. And this is useful because it will help me to become more sensitive to catching myself later if I start whipping myself up into a frenzy again. That is a thought create some distance from my thoughts. It reinforces the belief that I have thoughts. I have feelings. 
which is far better and much more workable than I am my thoughts, I am my feelings. There is no distance in I am my thoughts, I am my feelings. That's why we get overwhelmed so easily. We have thoughts. We are not our thoughts. And then the second technique I could use goes a bit deeper than that. By trying to identify the feeling beneath the thought, the feeling that the thought is creating. So I'm sitting or walking or pacing and a thought crosses my mind. The thought might be, women are going to stop reporting their rapes because they don't want to be persecuted if they get pregnant and try to abort. And that's a terrible thought, but what is the emotion behind the thought? What does that thought create within me? And it's fear. I'm afraid for the women who will be forced to endure violence and then be silenced for it. Women like my mom. So many babies are going to be born to sick and resentful mothers. That's another thought. The emotion beneath that thought is fear for children like me. Fear born of my deep empathy for children who are going to have to live like that. I can't protect them, just like I couldn't protect my mom. That's a thought. And the emotion is helplessness. And because I have so much experience with helplessness over the years, it's going to come up in times like this. They've overturned abortion today, and next year it's going to be gay marriage. And again, this is another thought, and the emotion behind it is fear. And maybe a bit of anger, because I don't want my marriage to my wife to be invalidated by anyone, let alone the Supreme Court. So by doing this exercise, by doing this for 20 or 30 minutes, however long I can stand it, I can figure out what I'm feeling, why I feel it, and it will help me see myself and the situation more clearly. And we need a clear mind in times of crisis. We will be more effective at protecting and taking care of ourselves and other people if we can keep our heads clear. So the technique seems simple, but don't underestimate why it's so useful. And then another meditation technique that I rely on that you've heard me mention several times is Tonglen, T-O-N-G-L-E-N, which is a chance for me to ventilate my big feelings and also to cultivate my empathy and compassion for everyone else who is stuck in the same situation that I am. I can sit down and breathe for them. On the inhale, I can imagine that I'm taking away all of their pain and terror and outrage and helplessness. And on the exhale, I can send out that relief and love as much as I can to those people. And again, this works for any emotional crisis. If you're lucky enough to be in a loving marriage, one day your spouse will still die. And when that day comes, you can breathe in the grief of all the grieving spouses who are suffering from their loss just like you are. You can exhale the love and support and relief to those other grieving spouses. If your child is sick, you breathe in the suffering of every other parent out there sitting by a child's sickbed right now. And you exhale as much love and peace and compassion as you can to them. This practice is a good reminder that we are never alone. Whatever we're feeling, no matter how horrible, it's not unique. No matter how specific your situation is, there is someone out there right now who is suffering the exact way you're suffering. We are never alone in our anguish. And if we can connect to that, not only will we find strength and comfort, but we'll develop our capacity for empathy and compassion, which is so important when it comes to taking better care of ourselves. And apart from these meditation techniques or using contemplation to kind of sort things out in your mind, there's also a way to physically release the emotions that you're dealing with. Because like I've mentioned in earlier episodes, stress and emotion does accumulate in the body. And if you're fighting with your feelings, chances are it might be piling up in your muscles. And so we need to get rid of that. Two of my favorite forms of physical release are yoga and screaming. Now, the screaming does not need much explanation, I'm sure. I would only caution you to be responsible about where and how you scream. For example, I am personally very triggered by screaming, so I would be super alarmed if someone just started howling within my vicinity. And frankly, I do not need any more triggers right now. Yoga is also good. I like yoga with Adrian, and she has a video called Yoga for Suffering that might be perfect for this moment. But really, anything with hip releases or deep stretches that will help you to sit in a pose for a while is usually pretty good at releasing emotions from the body. You could also go for a run or a long walk, getting any kind of exercise. If you do any or all of these things, the meditating, the exercising, the yoga, your emotions will weaken. 
they will burn themselves out. The natural lifespan of an emotion, even a strong one, is only about 90 seconds. They're like fruit flies. They've got no longevity. But the reason they keep coming back and why they stay for so long is because we feed them. We start thinking again about how horrible something is and it reignites the emotion for us. And we tell ourselves stories about that emotion, so we keep it alive and we keep churning it up. And that really just prolongs our suffering. So try to think of this as an opportunity to practice letting go. And it is hard. It really is hard. But please keep trying. Keep working to regain control of your energy, of your mind, until these things just burn themselves out. And try to be patient with yourself in the process. Don't beat yourself up if you're not relaxing as quickly as you think you should or getting back on your feet as quickly as you think you should. Just let all of that go and accept whatever's happening to you. But once you do start to feel more like yourself, then you will be back in captain mode. I almost forgot about the whole spaceship, (laughs) but here we are. We're back on the ship. You are the captain. The hole has been sealed off, the energy diverted, and now what? Ask yourself, how bad is the damage? And what can you do? And this might also be a good time to reconnect with other people, with your crew, your spaceship crew, your life crew. You could start by reaching out to the people you love or to the people who love you, and you can just be honest with them. You could say, look, I'm not okay. I had to tell several friends this past weekend, hey, I am not okay. I'm really struggling for this. And they totally got it. They understood. They sent me a lot of dog videos, a lot of very cute animals doing very cute animal things. I got lots of reminders that there are people who care about me, who love me, and who are here for me if I need to reach out. And that is one good thing about crisis. It often is an opportunity to deepen our connection to other people. I'll just say be careful about who you reach out to, especially if you're feeling very tender, because not everyone is safe. Some people will absolutely shut you down or use your emotions against you or say the wrong thing. So be wise. But I stand by the notion that generally this is an opportunity to connect with other people, to learn how to accept love and support from others, which I definitely need more practice with and I cannot be the only one. A chance to practice being loving, being supporting of others too if it's a shared crisis. There's a lot of emotional strength to be gained in these situations. It's also a chance to have your faith in humanity restored. And I know you're thinking, what fresh hell is this? How in the world could a crisis, like Roe vs. Wade, for example, be a chance to have your faith in humanity restored? To which I say, do you remember Mr. Rogers? Depending on your age, you might not, and you might have to look him up. But Mr. Rogers used to say that when he saw terrible things on the television, his mother would tell him, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. And it's true. Bad things have happened since the beginning of time. And every one of those events has been a chance for us to find the helpers, to see the bravery in people, to see the loving nature of people who show up and who fight and do whatever they can. And sometimes despite really terrifying odds, they still show up. They still do what they can to help people. So look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Train your mind to see the good, not just the bad. And this will help you build up your own positive worldview, which will help your own sense of well-being later. And you could even strengthen this by getting out there and being a helper yourself. Maybe this will inspire you to do more for the things you care about. Crisis often brings awareness of things that are overlooked. The fact is, is that many women were struggling with reproductive issues before Roe versus Wade was overturned. Black women, women of color, poor women, they were already struggling to get access to contraception and abortion. There were huge gaps in the support networks around these issues. Children were already being born to rapists and victims were seeing their children being handed over to their rapists without regard for how the mothers would be manipulated and controlled by their rapists for the next 18 years or more. Because often, you know, these fathers would still get parental rights to the babies. So there was plenty for me to be mad about. All of that was happening before this ruling by the Supreme Court. So it would seem a little self-righteous of me that I could ignore that on most days, but now I can't. That's a good thing. I'm activated. Now I will be paying more attention to these problems. Now that I've been made aware, I will do more. And that's a benefit of crisis. It makes us more aware of what matters to us, of what we care about, and it motivates us to do better. So just think about that. 
think about what good takeaways you can gain even from this very difficult trying experience that you're going through, whatever your emotional crisis is. Think about how it could strengthen you, how it could empower you, how it could heal you, and just sort of surrender to that. Surrender to the process and let it make you better for it. Let it make you be better for the experience. And lastly, I just want to say, let your crisis transform you. Let your crisis change you. I really do believe that every crisis is an opportunity to become a more compassionate, stronger, wiser person. My mother's murder was definitely transformative for me. Loving her was certainly transformative to me. It changed me. And as terrible as most crises are, they do have benefits. So that's it for this episode. Here is my little piece of love going out into a grieving world, and I really hope it was useful. I hope that no matter whenever you're listening to this and no matter what's going on in your life, that this will serve as a blueprint for helping you find your way back to yourself. Because remember, you are your greatest asset. Never be ashamed of taking care of yourself when you need to, even if the whole world is falling apart around you. You still have every right to take care of yourself. And I will be back next week with another episode. But until then, please, 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 please take good care of you. This episode of A Well-Cared-For Human was written and produced by me, Corey Marie. The music was by Late Night Feeler and Esther Abrami. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider visiting my Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you get early ad-free access to the episodes, as well as a monthly patrons-only Q&A, bonus videos, and more. Not to mention that your Patreon support lets me know that you find value in the show and want it to continue. You can find me on Patreon by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Corey Marie. If you can't support the show financially, that is okay. You can still subscribe to the show, leave a review of the show, and recommend the show to your friends, not just the neurotic ones. All of this helps so much. And as always, thank you for listening.